just as one who is to be admitted to Judaism must first submit to the three ceremonies of circumcision, baptism, and sacrifice, so Israel did not receive the Torah until they had performed these three ceremonies. They had already undergone circumcision in Egypt. Baptism was imposed upon them two days before the revelation on Mount Sinai. On the day preceding the revelation, Moses recorded in a book the covenant between Israel and their God. And on the morning of the day of the revelation, sacrifices were offered as a strengthening of the covenant. As there were no priests at that time, the service was performed by the elders of Israel, who, in spite of their age, performed their duty with youthful vigor. Moses erected an altar on Mount Sinai, as well as twelve memorial pillars, one for each tribe, and then told them to bring bulls as a burned offering and a peace offering. The blood of these animals was then separated exactly into two halves. This was attended to by the angel Michael, who guided Moses' hand and so conducted the separation of the blood that there might not be one more drop in one half than the other. Then God said to Moses, Sprinkle one half of the blood on the people as a token that they will not trade my glory for the idols of other peoples, and sprinkle the other half on the altar as a token that I will not exchange them for any other nation. Moses did as he was told, and lo, the miracle came to pass that the blood of a few animals sufficed to sprinkle every single Israelite. Before this covenant between God and Israel had been made, Moses read aloud to the people all of the Torah, that they might know exactly what they were taking upon themselves. This reading of the covenant was done a second time in the desert of Moab by Moses, and a third time by Joshua after his entrance into the Promised Land, on the mountains of Gerizim in Ebal. Although the people had now clearly expressed their desire to accept the Torah, God still hesitated to give it to them, saying, Shall I, without further ado, give you the Torah? No. Bring me bondsmen that will be hostage to me, ensuring you will observe it. Then I will give you the Torah. Israel said, O Lord of the world, our fathers are bondsmen for us. God replied, Your fathers are my debtors, and therefore not good bondsmen. Remember, Abraham said, How shall I know it? and thus proved himself lacking in faith. Isaac loved Esau, whom I hated, and Jacob did not immediately upon his return from Padan Aram keep his vow that he made on his way there. Bring me good bondsmen, and I will give you the Torah. Israel, our prophets shall be your bondsmen. God, I have claims against them, for, like foxes in the deserts, your prophets were afraid of you. Bring me good bondsmen, and I will give you the Torah. Israel, we will give you our children as bondsmen. God, well then, these are good bondsmen, on whose bond I will give you the Torah. Then the Israelites brought their wives with their babes at their breasts, and their pregnant wives. And God made the bodies of the pregnant women transparent as glass and he addressed the children in the womb with these words, Behold, I will give your fathers the Torah. Will you be surety for them that they will observe it? They answered, Yes. He furthermore said, I am your God. They answered, Yes. You shall have no other gods. They said, No. In this way, the children in the womb answered every commandment with yes and every prohibition with no. As it was the little children upon whose bond God gave his people the Torah, it comes to pass that many little children die when Israel does not observe the Torah. The Revelation on Mount Sinai From the first day of the third month, the day on which Israel arrived at Mount Sinai, a heavy cloud rested upon them, and everyone except Moses was forbidden to ascend the mountain. They dared not even stay near it, lest God smite those who pushed forward with hail or fiery arrows. The day of the revelation announced itself as an ominous day, even in the morning, for diverse rumblings sounded from Mount Sinai, 
Flashes of lightning, accompanied by an ever-swelling sound of horns, moved the people with mighty fear and trembling. God bent the heavens, moved the earth, and shook the boundaries of the world, so that the depths trembled and the heavens grew frightened. His splendor passed through the four portals of fire, earthquake, storm, and hail. The kings of the earth trembled in their palaces, and they all came to the villain Balaam and asked him if God intended the same fate for them as for the generation of the flood. But Balaam said to them, You fools, the Holy One, blessed be he, has long since promised Noah never again to punish the world with a flood. The kings of the heathen, however, were not quieted, and furthermore said, God has indeed promised never again to bring a flood on the world, but perhaps he now means to destroy it by means of fire. Balaam said, No, God will not destroy the world through either fire nor through water. The commotion throughout nature was caused through this only, that he is now about to bestow the Torah upon his people. The Eternal will give strength to his people. At this all the kings shouted, May the Eternal bless his people with peace. And each one, quieted in spirit, went to his house. Just as the inhabitants of the earth were alarmed at the revelation and believed the end of all time had arrived, so too did the earth. She thought the resurrection of the dead was about to take place and she would have to account for the blood of the slain that she had absorbed and for the bodies of the murdered whom she had covered. The earth was not calmed until she heard the first words of the Decalogue. Although the phenomena were perceptible on Mount Sinai in the morning, still God did not reveal himself to the people until noon. For, owing to the shortness of the summer nights and the pleasantness of morning sleep in summer, the people were still asleep when God had descended on Mount Sinai. Moses went to the encampment and awakened them with these words, Arise from your sleep. The bridegroom is at hand, and he is waiting to lead his bride under the marriage canopy. Moses, at the head of the procession, then brought the nation to its bridegroom, God, to Sinai. Moses himself going up the mountain, he said to God, Announce your words, your children are ready to obey them. These words of Moses rang out near and far, for on this occasion his voice when he repeated the words of God to the people, had as much power as the divine voice that he heard. It was not indeed quite of their own free will that Israel declared themselves ready to accept the Torah. For when the whole nation, in two divisions, men and women, approached Sinai, God lifted up the mountain and held it over the heads of the people like a basket, saying to them, If you accept the Torah, it is well. Otherwise, you will find your grave under this mountain. They all burst into tears and poured out their heart in contrition before God, and then said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Hardly had they uttered these words of submission when a hundred and twenty myriads of angels descended and provided every Israelite with a crown and a girdle of glory divine gifts which they did not lose until they worshipped the golden calf. Then the angels came and took the gifts away. At the same time, with these crowns and girdles of glory, a heavenly radiance was shed over their faces, but this also they later lost through their own sins. Only Moses retained it, whose face shone so brightly that even if today a crack were made in his tomb, the light emanating from his corpse would be so powerful that it would destroy all the world. After God had bestowed these wonderful gifts, he wanted to proceed to the announcement of the Torah, but he did not want to do so while Moses was with him, that the people might not say that it was Moses who had spoken out of the cloud. Hence he sought an excuse to be rid of him. He therefore said to Moses, Go down and warn the people that they shall not press forward to see. For even if one of them were to be destroyed, the loss to me would be as great as if all the creation had been destroyed. Tell Nadab and Abihu also, as well as the firstborn, that they are to perform the priestly duties, and to beware that they do not press forward. Moses, however, 
desirous of remaining with God, replied, I have already warned the people and set the bounds beyond which they may not venture. God hereupon said to Moses, Go, descend and call upon Aaron to come up with you, while the people do not move beyond the positions you have assigned them. Hardly had Moses left the mountain when God revealed the Torah to the people. This was the sixth revelation on earth since the creation of the world. The tenth and last is to take place on the day of judgment. The heavens opened and Mount Sinai, freed from the earth, rose into the air, so that its summit towered into the heavens, while a thick cloud covered its sides and touched the feet of the divine throne. Accompanying God on one side appeared 22,000 angels with crowns for the Levites, the only tribe that remained true to God, while the rest worshipped the golden calf. On the second side were 60 myriads, 3,550 angels, each bearing a crown of fire for each individual Israelite. Double this number of angels was on the third side, whereas on the fourth side they were simply innumerable. For God did not appear from one direction, but from all four simultaneously, which, however, did not prevent his glory from filling the heaven as well as the earth. In spite of these innumerable hosts of angels, there was no crowding on Mount Sinai, no mob. There was room for all the angels that had appeared in honor of Israel and the Torah. They had, however, at the same time received the order to destroy Israel in case they intended to reject the Torah. The First Commandment The first word of God on Sinai was, Anokai, it is I. It was not a Hebrew word, but an Egyptian word that Israel first heard from God. He treated them as did that king treated his homecoming son, who he addressed in the language the son had acquired in the foreign land. So, God addressed Israel in Egyptian, because it was the language they spoke. At the same time, Israel recognized in this word, Anokai, that this was God who addressed them. For when Jacob had assembled his children round his deathbed, he warned them to be mindful of the glory of God, and confided to them the secrets that God would reveal to them with the word Anokai. He said, With the word Anokai he addressed my grandfather Abraham, with the word Anokai, he addressed my father Isaac, and with the word Anokai, he addressed me. Know then that when he comes to you and he addresses you so, it is he, but not otherwise. When the first commandment had come out of the mouth of God, thunder and lightning proceeded from his mouth. A torch was at his right and a torch at his left, and his voice flew through the air, saying, my people, my people, house of Israel, I am the Eternal, your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Israel heard the awful voice, they flew back in horror twelve miles and their souls flew out of them. Upon this the Torah turned to God, saying, Lord of the world, have you given me to the living or to the dead? God said, To the living, the Torah but they are all dead. God, for your sake I will restore them to life. Then he let fall upon them the dew that will hereafter revive the dead, and they return to life. The trembling of heaven and earth that set in upon the sound of the divine voice alarmed Israel so greatly that they could hardly stand on their feet. God then sent to every one of them two angels. One lay his hand upon the heart of each that his soul might return and one to lift the head of each, that he might behold his Maker's splendor. They beheld the glory of God, as well as the otherwise invisible word, when it emanated from the divine vision, and rolled back to their ears, whereupon they received these words, Will you accept the Torah which contains 248 commandments, corresponding to the number of members of your body? They answered, Yes, yes. Then the word passed from the ear to the mouth. It kissed the mouth, then rolled again to the ear and called to it, Will you accept the Torah, 
which contains 365 prohibitions corresponding to the days of the year. And when they replied yes, yes again, the word turned from the ear to the mouth and kissed it. After the Israelites had in this way taken upon themselves the commandments and the prohibitions, God opened the seven heavens and the seven earths and said, Behold, these are my witnesses that there is none like me in the heights or on the earth. See that I am the only one, and that I have revealed myself in my splendor and my radiance. If anyone should say to you, Go serve other gods, then you say, Can one who has seen his Maker face to face in his splendor, in his glory, and in his strength, leave him and become an idolater? See, it is I that have delivered you out of the house of bondage. It is I that divided the sea before you and led you on dry land, while submerging your enemies. I am the God of the dry land as well as the sea, of the past as well as of the future, the God of this world as well as the future worlds. I am the God of all nations, but only with Israel is my name allied. If they fulfill my wishes, I, the Eternal, will be merciful gracious and long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. But if you are disobedient, then I will be a stern judge. If you had not accepted the Torah, no punishment could have fallen on you. But now that you have accepted it, you must obey. In order to convince Israel of his unity and uniqueness, he told all nature to stand still, that all might see there is nothing beside him. When God bestowed the Torah, no bird sang, no ox lowed, the Ophanim did not fly, the seraphim uttered not their holy, 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 the sea did not roar, no creature uttered a sound. All listened in breathless silence to the words announced by an echoless voice. I am the Lord your God. These words, as well as the others made known by God on Mount Sinai, were not heard by Israel alone, but by the inhabitants of the whole earth. The divine voice divided itself into the seventy languages, so that all might understand. But, where Israel could listen to the voice without suffering harm, the souls of the heathen almost fled out of them when they heard it. When the divine voice sounded, all the dead in Sheol were revived, and went to Sinai for the revelation took place in the presence of the living as well as of the dead. Yes, even the souls of those who were not yet born were present. Every prophet, every sage, received at Sinai his share of the revelation, which in the course of history was announced by them to mankind. All heard indeed the same words, but the voice corresponded to the individuality of each this was God's way of speaking to them. And as the same voice sounded differently to each, so did the divine vision appear differently to each. Therefore God warned them not to ascribe the various forms to various beings, saying, Do not believe that because you have seen me in various forms there are various gods. I am the same that appeared to you at the Red Sea as a god of war, and at Sinai as a teacher the other commandments revealed on Sinai. After Israel had accepted the first commandment with a yes, God said, As you have now acknowledged me as your sovereign, I can now give you commands. You shall not acknowledge the gods of other nations as such, for they bring no advantage to those who adore them. This you shall not do while I exist. I have given you my Torah in order to lend sovereignty to you. Hence you must not kindle my wrath by breaking my covenant through idolatry. You shall not worship dead idols, but him who kills and restores to life, and in whose hand are all the living things. Do not learn the works of other nations, for their works are vanity. I, the Eternal, your God, rule over zeal, and am not ruled by it. I wait until the fourth generation to visit punishment. But those who love me or fear me, I will reward to one thousand generations.
when Moses heard these words, according to which God would punish the descendants for the sins of their fathers only if the consecutive generations were, one after another, sinful, he cast himself on the ground and thanked God, for he knew it never occurred among Israel that three consecutive generations were sinful. The third commandment read, O my people of Israel, none among you shall call the name of the Lord in vain. For he who swears falsely by the name of the Lord shall not go unpunished on the great judgment day. Swearing falsely has terrible consequences, not only for the one who does it, but it endangers all the world. For when God created the world, he laid over the abyss a shard, on which is engraved the ineffable name, that the abyss may not burst forth and destroy the world. But as often as one swears falsely in God's name, the letters of the ineffable name fly away. And as there is then nothing to restrain the abyss, the waters burst forth from it to destroy the world. This would surely come to pass if God did not send the angel Yaasriel, who has charge of the seventy pencils, to engrave anew the ineffable name on the shard. God then said to Israel, If you accept my Torah and observe my laws, I will give you for all eternity a thing most precious that I have in my possession. What is it? replied Israel. God, the future world. Israel, but even in this world should we have a foretaste of the other? God, the Sabbath will give you this foretaste. For when the world was created, the seventh day came before God and said to him, All that you have created is in couples. Why not I? God replied, The community of Israel shall be your spouse. Of this promise God made to the seventh day, he reminded the people on Mount Sinai when he gave them the fourth commandment to keep the Sabbath holy. When the nations of the earth heard the first commandment, they said, There is no king that does not like to see himself acknowledged as sovereign, and so does God desire his people to pledge him their allegiance. At the second commandment, they said, No king suffers a king besides himself, nor does the God of Israel. At the third commandment, they said, Is there a king that would like to have people swear false oaths by his name? At the fourth commandment, they said, No king dislikes to see his birthday celebrated. But when the people heard the fifth commandment, Honor your father and your mother, they said, According to our laws, if a man enrolls himself as a servant of the king, he thereby disowns his parents. God, however, makes it a duty to honor father and mother. Truly, for this is honor due to him. It was with these words that the fifth commandment was emphasized. Honor your parents to whom you owe existence, as you honor me. Honor the body that bore you, and the breast that gave you suck. Maintain your parents, for your parents took part in your creation. For man owes his existence to God, to his father, and to his mother, in that he receives from each of his parents five of the parts of his body, and ten from God. The bones, the veins, the nails, the brain, and the white of the eye come from the father. The mother gives him skin, flesh, blood, hair, and the pupil of the eye. God gives him the following, breath, soul, light of countenance, sight, hearing, speech, touch, sense, insight, and understanding. When a human being honors his parents, God says, I consider it as if I had dwelled among men and they had honored me. But if people do not honor their parents, God says, It is good that I do not dwell among men, or they would have treated me superciliously too. God not only commanded to love and fear parents as himself, but in some respects he places the honor due to parents even higher than that due him. A man is only obliged to support the poor or to perform certain religious ceremonies if he has the wherewithal. But it is the duty of each one even to go begging at men's doors if he cannot otherwise maintain his parents. The Sixth Commandment said, O my people Israel, be not killers of men, 
do not associate with murderers and shun their companionship that your children may not learn the craft of murder. As a penalty for the deeds of murder, God will send a devastating war over mankind. There are two divisions in Sheol, an inner and an outer. In the latter are all those who were slain before their time. There they stay until the course of the time predestined for them is run. And every time a murder has been committed, God says, Who has slain this person and has forced me to keep him in the outer Sheol, so that I must appear unmerciful to have removed him from the earth before his time? On the judgment day, the slain will appear before God and will implore him, O Lord of the world, you formed me, you developed me, you have been gracious to me while I was in the womb, so that I left it unharmed. You, in your great mercy, have provided for me. O Lord of the worlds, grant me satisfaction from this villain that knew no pity for me. Then God's wrath will be kindled against the murderer. Into Gehenna he will throw him and damn him for all eternity, while the slain will see satisfaction and be glad. The seventh commandment says, O my people of Israel, be not adulterers, nor the accomplices or companions of adulterers, that your children after you may not be adulterers. Commit no unchaste deeds with your hands, feet, eyes, or ears, for as a punishment the plague will come over the world. This is the eighth commandment. Be not a thief, nor the accomplice or companion of thieves, that your children may not become thieves. As a penalty for robbery and theft, famine will come upon the world. God may forgive idolatry, but never theft, and he is always ready to listen to complaints against forgers and robbers. The ninth commandment reads, O my people Israel, bear not false witness against your companions, for in punishment for this the clouds will scatter, so that there may be no rain, and famine will ensue owing to the drought. God is particularly severe with false witness because falsehood is the one quality that God did not create, but is something that men themselves produce. The content of the Tenth Commandment is, O my people, Israel, covet not the possessions of your neighbors, for owing to this sin will the government take the possessions from the people, so that even the wealthiest will become poor and will have to go into exile. The Tenth Commandment is directed against a sin that sometimes leads to a trespassing of all the Ten Commandments. If a man covets his neighbor's wife and commits adultery, he neglects the first commandment, I am the Eternal, your God, for he commits his crime in the dark and thinks that no one sees him, not even the Lord, whose eyes float over all the world and see good as well as evil. He oversteps the second commandment, you shall not have strange gods before me, for I am a jealous God, who is wroth against faithlessness, whether towards me or toward men. He breaks the third commandment, You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, for he swears he has not committed adultery, but he did so. He is the cause of profanation of the Sabbath, the consecration of which God commands in the fourth commandment, because in his illegal relation, he generates descendants who will perform priestly duties in the temple, which, being bastards, they have no right to do. The fifth commandment will be broken by the children of the adulterer, who will honor as a father a strange man, and will not even know their true father. He breaks the sixth commandment, You shall not kill, if he is surprised by the rightful husband. For every time a man goes to a strange woman, he does so with the consciousness that this may lead to his death or the death of his neighbor. The trespassing of the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery, is the direct outcome of a forbidden coveting. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal, is broken by the adulterer, for he steals another man's fountain of happiness. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness, is broken by the adulterous woman who pretends that the fruit of her criminal relations is the child of her husband. In this way, the breaking of the Tenth Commandment has not only led to all the other sins, 
but also to the evil effect that the deceived husband leaves his whole property to one who is not his son, so that the adulterer robs him of his possessions as well as of his wife. Next, the unity of the Ten Commandments. End Part 51 of 95, thelegendsofthejews.com